When people talk about transactions, they usually have monetary transactions in mind. So for example, Alice sending some money to Bob. Now in a blockchain context, that's just one of many options you have. You can, of course, send value, but you can also interact with smart contracts, deploy new smart contracts, and more importantly, things that would require many different kinds of transactions in the more traditional financial system can be done through one single transaction. And that is exactly what we're going to look at right now. All right, transactions. Let's actually start with a very quick and brief uh, definition of what a transaction actually is. The transaction essentially you can think of as a, an instruction or a message that is sent from an externally owned account. So it is sent from one of these accounts we have created in the last video, uh, an account that is controlled by a private key. And from these EOAs, um, basically you're initiating the transaction, um, you're adding some information to it, what exactly you want to change. And the main information or the main changes you can trigger are Ether balances. So that's what we've done last time. Basically, when you're sending some value with a transaction to a different address, then you're changing your Ether value, uh, your account balance and the account balance of the recipient. Or what you can also do and or actually um, you can change the contract accounts storage. So in various smart contracts, as you will see in the course uh, of this class, um, you will have so-called storage variables. So basically um, states that are reflected within the smart contract and that can be changed. And of course, these states and these variables are also changed through transactions. So with the transaction, you're basically triggering the change. And when the transaction gets executed and confirmed, uh, then this new uh, state will be stored again in the smart contract on the blockchain. So that's uh, when you're changing a contract accounts storage. Now, transactions optionally contain Ether. Um, so you don't have to send Ether. You can also have a zero value transaction. Um, and then, of course, data, uh, when you're interacting with a smart contract, so when you're calling a method, when you're calling a function, when you're interacting with it, then usually you have to send some arguments and parameters along. Also, when you're deploying a smart contract, then obviously you need some data that, it, uh, that contains the uh, instructions for how to deploy the smart contract, uh, what is actually smart contract code that uh, needs to be deployed. Mm, transactions, again, uh, are something that can be exclusively initiated by an EOA or externally owned account, so by an account that is controlled by a, a private key. So we have, in fact, three different kinds of transactions. Number one, that's what we've done last time with your account one and account two. That's the simplest form. It's EOA to EOA. And the only thing you can do with EOA to EOA uh, is transfer some value. Uh, so basically you're saying, okay, I have this Ether, I want to transfer this Ether to this new account. So you have EOA to EOA. Um, with EOA to CA, externally owned account to contract account, of course you can also transfer some value um, if, the, if the smart contract accepts the value. But usually what you're doing is you're going with contract execution. So you're picking one of the functions of the smart contract and you're interacting with it as I said, you're sending some parameters, arguments along uh, the way with the transaction, um, then the function gets executed um, depending on what you have sent with this transaction. That's basically interacting with the smart contract, interacting with the contract account. And that's the second form of transaction. And the third form of transaction is contract deployment. I've mentioned that last time already, uh, where you're creating a new smart contract, where you're sending the transaction to the zero address and uh, send some data alongside the transaction where you're deploying the smart contract. So it's basically the instruction, the code for the deployment. Now, contract accounts send internal transactions. When you go back quickly, I said, uh, transactions, actual transactions can only be initiated by EOA, so by externally owned accounts. 
um, um, as I've mentioned already, contract accounts cannot initiate any action by themselves, but what they can do is they um, can forward these transactions so they can, when they got triggered by a transaction, when a transaction has been sent to a specific smart contract, to a specific contract account, uh, then they can um, initiate a so-called internal transaction, which is basically like a transaction, but it's contained within the initiating transaction. So CAs can only issue internal transactions or internal calls, and we will also talk about that uh, on one of the next slides. A non-internal transaction, so an initiating transaction, can never originate with a smart contract. In other words, initially, a contract accounts must be triggered by an EOA, by an externally owned account transaction. So well, here's just a very, very simple high-level example. Um, this is a symbol for an EOA right here, um, this person. And this person initiates a transaction, signs a transaction, um, calls a function uh, with a smart contract. Here, that's our uh, symbol for the smart contract. Um, passes some parameters along. The function is executed, smart contract. And within the same transaction, so this is actually all one transaction right here, um, the smart contract generates an internal transaction and uh, interacts with another smart contract. So this smart contract um, calls a function in this smart contract and also pass, passes some arguments along that. So you can have, as you probably can imagine right now, quite complex change of interactions and in many DeFi applications, and that's where we eventually will go, you have these chains of interactions where you call one smart contract a function and one smart contract. And then this smart contract interacts with yet a different smart contract and so on. That's something that's called composability. So the idea that whenever there is a smart contract deployed somewhere, um, it can be used not just by the users, but also by different smart contracts that can interact with uh, the functions of that one smart contract. What I mean, I've already mentioned that, but just um, for the sake of a very simple example, what you cannot do, what is impossible is, for example, develop a smart contract that says, okay, uh, me, the smart contract, I am listening for something that may happen on the blockchain. And when that happens, then I am gonna initiate a transaction. As I've said several times already, smart contracts cannot initiate transactions themselves. They cannot listen for events or anything like that. They always have to be triggered by a transaction that comes from an externally owned account or for that matter, another contract account, but then it has to be started, it has to be started with, a, with an EOA anyways, uh, and can only react to that incoming transaction uh, with a uh, internal transaction when they wanna forward it. So that's the channel setup. And also when we talk about these um, very complex transactions, so where many different things happen actually within one transaction, um, that's how it works. So you're initiating one transaction, then within that one transaction container, you have actually many different internal transactions. That's a concept that will also be super important when we talk about uh, flash loans later on in the DeFi context. Now we have various different terms. Uh, number one, a transaction. Um, just for the sake of completeness, I'm gonna uh, revisit that concept really quick. They must originate with an EOA. Uh, states can only change through transactions uh, or internal transactions for that matter. And each transaction leads to a state change. So the minimum change you have with each transaction um, is the iteration of the nodes. Uh, when you're issuing a transaction, when it gets confirmed, then the nonce of the of this uh, sender address will be adjusted. Uh, we'll add one to it, and uh, next time the same address wants to send a transaction, they have to use a, a higher nonce, so the next one, uh, the subsequent one. And uh, as I said, it may contain multiple internal transactions and or internal calls. Now, let's first go with calls, and that's something new I haven't mentioned before. Uh, a call is executed locally on the node. So basically with a pure call, when you really have a call, just a standalone call, um, then it's something that does not even require a transaction, that does not um, require um, any uh, writing to the blockchain. 
uh, that is not subject to a transaction fee because the only thing you're doing is you're reading information from the blockchain. So you're calling some information and you can do that. You can always do that um, in some cases with a function, but also even when there is no explicit function, of course, you could still analyze the blockchain and get the information out. But here a call, a uh, regular call um, with, that is not part of a transaction, as I said, does not consume any gas, con does not consume any transaction fees. It's just you looking up something that is stored on the blockchain. An internal transaction is a transaction that is part of another transaction. So as I said, it's initiated by these contract accounts. And when the contract account um, is triggered by a transaction or by another internal transaction, it can itself create yet a new internal transaction where it is uh, calling another function from another smart contract. So it can really create these uh, sequences that I've shown on the last slide. And then again, something new, new concept, the internal call, it's essentially a call. So again, it's read only, you're requesting some information, but this time, since it is internal, since it is part of a transaction, it is actually subject to a network fee because it gets evaluated as part of a transaction. And then of course, you have to pay the network for evaluating it. And the difference right here is in, with an internal call, you can use whatever you're getting back. So when you're reading some information, you can use that in the context of the transaction. Uh, you can do something with it. Whereas when you have a, a regular call uh, that is not part of a transaction, it's really just for your information, but you cannot evaluate it in the context of a transaction because you're just requesting the information outside of a transaction. So that's the difference. Now, I have to mention these are these terms are somewhat used loosely. I mean, there is, this is um, some terminology I personally, I support. I think it makes sense and many people actually use it in that way. But when you're reading some articles online, for example, uh, then many of these concepts uh, get mixed up and uh, it's not always clear when people refer to a call, what exactly they mean. It's not always clear when they refer to a transaction, to an internal transaction. There are things like messages also thrown around. But uh, I think this definition makes it relatively clear what exactly exists, what are the differences uh, of these different kinds uh, of transactions and calls and gives you some intuition of how you can interact with the blockchain. Now let's have a more detailed look at transactions. So an Ethereum transaction always contains the following data points. It's uh, number one, the recipient address. So you're always addressing a transaction at some address. This can be an externally owned account. This can also be a contract account. And of course it's the recipient's hexadecimal address. Then the nonce, uh, we've already talked about that several times with uh, EOAs. So in the case of a transaction, it always has to be an EOA. It's a transaction count from the sender. Then you have the signature consisting of three variables, V, R, and S. I'm not going to go into the details. If you're interested in how exactly signatures work, uh, watch the videos from Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto assets. So the other lecture we have, uh, there we're looking into different kinds of signatures in uh, quite some detail. And then you have things like gas limit and gas price. And uh, this is essentially the um, variables you need for the transaction fees. So for specifying the transaction fees, the gas limit is the maximum number of execution steps you're willing to take. And the gas price is the fee the sender is willing to pay per execution step. Uh, we will have a dedicated video just for the transaction fee system. And there we will also talk about EIP 1559. Uh, so that's the new transaction fee system in Ethereum that has just been recently added to the system and that works slightly different. So uh, right here in this video, I'm not gonna say more about the transaction fees. It's just uh, in the original implementation, yet these two things, gas limit, gas price. And uh, it's important to understand that you can set the maximum number of computational steps that you're willing to take and also how much you're willing to pay uh, for any given execution step. Depending on the transaction purpose, there are uh, further things you may add. Uh, so number one is the value for value in way, uh, which is just 10 to the power of 18 um, way R1 ETH. And then some data when you have contract execution or deployment instructions. So that is optional, but these are two more things you can add to a transaction.
Now let's look at uh, an example. And this is actually the first one. And as you can see right here, this is a simple value transaction. So you're sending it from one account. And apparently that's Coinbase right here, centralized exchange that did that to a non account right here. And you are transferring some Ether. You have the value right here. And this, this information, by the way, is again from Etherscan, so from the Block Explorer you've used in the last video and in the uh, end of chapter exercises where you can look at various kinds of transactions. And it's a good idea that you do that, that you just get familiar with the, these different kinds of transactions, get used to it before we are actually continue with issuing transactions, our own more complex transactions. Then we have a second transaction. This is, in fact, EOA to CA. So you can see uh, it's, it is from an EOA, from an externally owned account right here. That's the address. And then when you look at the uh, uh, recipient, it's a contract. It's this contract right here. And it already says in brackets on the scan that is actually a token. That's the DAI stablecoin. So we will look into tokenization, of course, in greater detail, and we will develop our own tokens. But something you have to know right now is that tokens... Uh, essentially are additional assets that are created on Ethereum. And the way they are created is through smart contracts. So you create a new smart contract. This smart contract essentially stores the balances of different addresses in that newly created token. And that's exactly what you're seeing right here. Uh, so the contract account right here, this address is essentially the database um, that uh, um, keeps track of the DAI, so of this of this tokens, uh, balances for various addresses. So what we're doing right here is from our externally owned account, from this one, uh, we're sending a transaction to the DAI stablecoin contract account. And when you look down here, you, you're calling the function transfer, uh, you're specifying a recipient address, and you're specifying the value you want to transfer in that stablecoin. And then when the, uh, when the transaction gets executed, um, in line with the contract account code on the on the uh, uh, DAI stablecoin smart contract, then the values in this DAI stablecoin, this token will be adjusted. So you will see uh, that the other address um, that is specified here in the data uh, will get some DAI and uh, our sender address will be deducted some DAI. And you can also see that right here, um, this is basically the summary for the transaction uh, of, of Etherscan. You can see from this address right here to this address, we are transferring some DAI stablecoin. So that's, that's actually super important to understand when you're dealing with tokens, you're calling one address, that's the token contract, and then the recipient of the actual tokens, you're specifying in the data where you're calling the function. So you can see here function transfer, uh, the address, as I said, is specified right here, so you'll find that down here. The value is specified right here, so you'll find that down here. And that's something the user or the wallet of the user has specified when they have initiated transaction. And this results in this transfer from this address to this address and this value in DAI stablecoin. And then our last example, also from Etherscan, that's just contract deployment. There isn't too much to say. I mean, it's super simple. Basically, what you're doing is uh, you're sending something to the zero address. Now here, don't get confused with this two. That is just the uh, way uh, Etherscan is representing it because uh, they're showing the contact that has been created, the newly created contract. And down here, you can see the code in bytecode. Again, don't get confused. Obviously, we will not develop our smart contracts in bytecode. Um, almost no one does that. Um, you're, we're using a high level programming language called Solidity, and then we're compiling everything into that bytecode. And that's essentially what you're sending alongside the transaction when you're deploying a smart contract. But that's obviously not how we will code our smart contracts later on. That's just the way they get um, included in a transaction and the way they are essentially deployed on the blockchain. All right. So that's it with our very simple transaction overview. Um, again, look at, Ethers, look at Etherscan, look at the various types of transactions, get familiar with them. It's super important that you have some understanding of the various kinds of transactions and what you can do with it. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we're ready uh, for the next video. Stay curious.
see you soon.